Today we are getting a little bit of a break from the lament psalms that we've been in more recently. And Psalm 16 uses a lot of imagery to talk about the blessing of God on, on the life of David, the psalmist. So I pray that as we unpack this, you can see the parallels in your own life so that we can be encouraged to thank God when we see his hand of blessing on our lives. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what he says in his word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach. And I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with him and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, before we get into today's episode, I have a quick word. I know that you have been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. I know, I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus, how he calls them, how he encourages them, how he equips them. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, helping you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I also include a lot of cultural and historical information that makes these familiar passages of scripture really come alive. This is a great study to do with maybe your teen girls or a group of friends from church, and it will really help you gain confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. Again, head to shehears.org and you can find the Bible study on the resources page. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. If you're just joining us, I want to let you know that we've transitioned some of our usual podcast content into a devotional reading of the Psalms. And that was basically prompted by a lot of requests from a lot of our listeners. So I pray that this content continues to bless you. And you can always reach me at rachel at shehears.org for feedback, questions, comments, all of those kinds of things. So Psalm 16, this is a Psalm of David. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the grave. Nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 16 is a nice break from some of the lament psalms that we've been in more recently. But there's a lot to unpack here, a lot of imagery that I want to go through to kind of give you some insight as to what they're referring to, what David's referring to with some of these images. Initially, in verse 2, where it says, a part From you, I have no good thing. Really what David is saying here is apart from God. David, as the psalmist, is is reiterating that there really is no meaning in life and no personal happiness apart from our relationship with God. So anything that gives our life meaning or anything that gives us happiness is a gift from God. It's part of God's goodness. And so without God's presence and essentially his blessing... Nothing in this life is truly going to feel good or satisfying. 
And the things that do start to enter that category will be temporary at best. And so the as the writer, David is basically essentially saying he's not going to have anything to do with the false gods or anything that takes priority over God. That's referred to in, in verse 4. And really his relationship with with Yahweh, with the true God, is what means everything to him. And so we see this expressed by Paul later in the New Testament, um, where he says that concept of, for me to live is Christ. That's essentially what David is saying here in the same regard. Now, in verse 4, it sounds kind of weird. It says, I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. What does that mean? Well, to be perfectly honest, there's no other reference to this in other Near Eastern texts. And so um, really, this has to come from scripture as far as the reference that that, that we know. And most scholars um, agree that there's no evidence of blood libations or libation meaning, meaning drink. Libation is... Uh, usually a drink offering of wine or beer sometimes. Sometimes in numbers you'll hear it referred to, uh, brandy referred to as a libation, but there's no parallels of that. And so uh, we're, we're not thinking that it's an actual blood libation. If anything, we think it is a uh, reference to probably wine. And because wine was drank at a lot of celebrations, that's kind of what it's referring to here. Because it's talking about the sorrows of um, the people that are running after false gods, the people that are turning away from God. And so if he's talking about their sorrows. He's saying, I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Essentially, what we think is going on is he's talking about... Um, when they're having their festivities or their celebrations, he's not going to be present or part of what they're doing. And that makes sense. As people that are not pursuing God, he's not going to bless the efforts that they have to keep them away from him. Then in verse 5, it says, Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. So in this verse, David is referring to the inheritance or the portion of God's of what God's people received when they entered into the promised land. So back in Numbers, um, we read about the inheritance of the fields and the land. And that's a representation of God's presence. So the cup is a metaphor, basically, you know, a figure of speech comparing one thing to another. It's a metaphor that refers to um, the drink that would be offered as an act of hospitality when somebody entered a place. And so in their culture, it is, I mean, it's similar in our culture and in a lot of cultures around the world. When somebody comes over, you always say, hey, can I get you a cup of coffee or can I get you a glass of water? So that cup is really a metaphor that is talking about that. So when it's saying, you've assigned me my portion and my cup, you have made my lot secure. What the metaphor is doing is it's really assigning the Lord to both the portion and and the cup. So he is our inheritance, but he is also the source of the blessing. And that is what contributes to our continued joy. So when he's saying, you have assigned me my portion and my cup, essentially he's saying, you have given me the physical blessing, but you are the one that continues to fill that cup or continues to give the blessing. So in the next verse, it talks about boundary lines. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, surely I have a delightful inheritance. Well, if you can imagine, this is, think about the time and the culture. This is an agrarian society, meaning they were farming for a lot of their livelihood. And the boundary lines would have been incredibly important. Even now, boundary lines are important. I live in uh, rural Pennsylvania, and above my house... We live at the end of a dead-end road. So above my house, there is acreage that is owned by one farmer, and he grows Timothy hay. And then there's another field below my house where they grow all sorts of things. Right now, it's, it's corn. And so because I live on the edge of those two properties, there's a point next to our house where both of those boundary lines meet. And we made a mistake very early on when we moved into this house. We had borrowed a moving truck from, from a friend of ours 
and we had unloaded it and we parked it at the bottom of our driveway kind of off the side onto part of the land. I will tell you that we met our neighbor very early on and he was not happy with us because where we had parked, it was in the way of how he brought his tractor in and out. And um, even that mistake, he let us know very early on where we could and where we could not park. And, and so perhaps this is a concept that makes sense to you, but if you don't live in a rural area, maybe you won't realize quite the, the weight of what he's saying when he's saying, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. The boundary line... We see this in other places too. We see the boundary line um, back in Deuteronomy where God is determining the boundaries for the nations. And in this culture, land sale contracts and boundary lines would be so clearly delineated that there would be no question over who owns which portion of land because parts of the land are going to be better um, and, and when they divide it up, this is what they pay attention to. Parts of that land is going to be better for farming or for raising your sheep or, or whatever it is. And you know that just based off of how land is here. Different values are assigned to different portions of land. It was the same thing. And it, honestly, in that culture, and I'm not talking about Israel, but I'm talking about the greater Mesopotamian culture at that time frame, if, if somebody violated the land boundary they had very detailed curses for, for those who that violated the boundary. It was that serious. And so if Yahweh, as God, is the sovereign Lord of the land, and he is allocating the boundaries for Israel, as well as all the other nations, um, that was a really important issue in the ancient Near East. And it, and it really closely tied to the inheritance rights. So they didn't just see it as a something for right now. They saw it for the inheritance of their family a provision for the family. And so we see this in Deuteronomy. There's an Old Testament law that talks about the movement of a boundary marker. And it w they wouldn't have cursed you like they would in the greater Mesopotamian area. But there was a serious offense included. And you can go back and read about that in Deuteronomy 19. Uh, I think it's in 27. In Job, it mentions it. In Proverbs, it mentions it a couple different times. And so there was legal customs in Egypt and in Mesopotamia and all the surrounding nations that really would um, make sure that those boundary markers were used and upheld. And sometimes they were very elaborately decorated and inscribed. And so what the psalmist is doing here is he is celebrating God's goodness to him because of the desirable land allocation that he's been given. And that is not just in the physical, but it's representative of the blessing in the spiritual as well. Okay, next in verse 8, it says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. So God's people should always be pursuing and, and cherishing their, their relationship with God a true, real, intimate relationship with God above anything else, any other relationships in this world. And so this um, idea of his continual presence being at our right hand, which represents this position of honor and authority and strength, strength it brings guidance to us, brings protection, joy, e you know, eternal impact, all of those things. But there's something I want to dig a little bit deeper on. And that's the imagery that we're seeing here in, in verse 8. So when it's talking about being positioned at the right hand, a fully armed warrior would hold his weapon in his right hand and then his shield in his left hand. So the person to the right of a king would have the privilege of defending him. So for a king to put someone there on his right side would mean an affirmation of trust and um, confidence that, that he is trustworthy and he could get the job done to defend him. And therefore, that is an honor. So, so I think we understand this idea of, okay, the right hand, we hear that enough, we know it's a position of honor, but that's really why it's seen as a position of honor. So when the Lord takes up his position, as someone's um, right hand side. So if he is saying he is at their right hand, here he is in a position to defend us with his shield. So when we put him 
in our right hand, or we recognize that he is saying he is at our right hand, that means he's our defender. So this is a metaphor that that can talk about the battlefield. It can talk about the courtroom. We talked a little bit about um, the paracletos, the, the Holy Spirit as our defender. This is essentially the same kind of imagery. We do see a lot of battle imagery because David was a warrior. And, and so we're going to see those kinds of things, the shield imagery, all those kinds of things coming up a lot. In the Mesopotamian world, in that kind of literature, there was a claim that a deity was stationed either before, behind, or at the side of an individual. So they believed that there was these gods around them all the time. And so this imagery of talking about being God at the right-hand side of us is talking about not just referring to what what would be combating what their beliefs were, but referring to what God is saying as our defender. He's on our right-hand side. Okay, and so then the last one is verse 10. It says, Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. So while this is literally referring to not allowing someone to be put to death, especially at the hand of, of their enemies um, or some sort of malicious intent, it's also referring to this idea that a personal relationship with God is what gives people the confidence for a future and a life with God and an eternity with God and that he will not abandon them in death. And as you can imagine, in this culture where war is common and famine and disease and all those things are common life expectancy was was a lot different than what it is right now there was this common fear of death and so what he's referring to is the certainty that we have when we are in relationship with God to know that he will not abandon us in death and so um the apostles themselves they applied this verse to Jesus. And so remember, we're talking about how the Psalms foreshadow Jesus or, or, or um, give us a picture of what we're going to see fulfilled in Jesus. This is one of those areas. Uh, Peter and Paul apply this verse to Christ when he, they're talking about his resurrection. So you can find that in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 13. And so um, in depending on the version that you have, the word sheol S-H-E-O-L is referred to here when it's talking about the grave. It's talking about Sheol. And so Sheol is found, let me see, I have it written down, 66 times in the Old Testament. And it's translated 55 different times, that word, as the grave. But sometimes, six different times, it's referred to as death. So whether we're talking about the grave or death, either way, we're saying as a believer, that is not permanent. God is not abandoning us even after death. And so in general, the Old Testament will view Sheol, the grave or the death, as a place associated with some sort of punishment. And and what we would probably call hell at this point. But but really, essentially, hell is a place where there's an absence of God. And and so when we're talking about Sheol, it's in, it's in that vein. And so when Jacob, if you remember back to Jacob, back in Genesis, we talk about how um, Jacob indicated that he would go down to the grave because of the loss of his son, Joseph. He's, he's saying that because he felt he was under God's judgment. And that's why he was refusing to be comforted in that scenario. And if you're not familiar with that, you can go back and read that in Genesis chapter 37. And there's really, in that story, there's no evidence that he tried to make any other requests of God until after he heard that Joseph was still alive. And so that's kind of uh, some background on this idea of Sheol. And so here, David is indicating that the grave, or Sheol, was the place where the wicked would go. We read that about that a couple days ago in, in uh, chapter 9. Other, other places throughout the Old Testament, in Isaiah... Uh, he refers to one of the kings of Assyria who was very ungodly. He talked about when he died, he would go to Sheol. And he talks about that being a terrible place in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 14. 
So there's several passages throughout the Old Testament that indicate that the Israelites did not expect to go to Sheol when they died, but instead they would go where they could enjoy God's presence, what we would refer to as heaven. And so David is anticipating that when he dies. He knows that he's going to live in the house of the Lord forever. Um, there's another psalm writer that talks about being rescued from the grave of Sheol and taken to heaven. And then even Solomon would talk about the path of the wise, the God-fearing person that leads to keep him from going down to the grave. It's that same word, Sheol. And so a lot of times when you see this word grave, you or or even a lot of times the word death, we have to look at the root word of that. And, and in this case, it's talking about Sheol. So thinking about that, he's saying, um, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. He's really talking about what happens after this life. So given those insights, I'm going to read Psalm 16 again. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Father God, we thank you for the way that you use imagery in the scriptures to make the reality of your heart for us known. God, I thank you for the wisdom that we see from David as he turns to you over and over and he takes delight in the blessing that can only come from you. God, I pray in those moments when we are experiencing your hand of blessing, when we are realizing that there's no way we could have the things that we have other apart from, from your blessing. God, help us to give you glory in those moments. Help us to praise you for your presence, to praise you for your blessing, and to even praise you about what will happen, the, the knowledge that we have of what will happen after we die, that even after we die, we know that even then you won't abandon us. God, we thank you for the provision you make for us um, through Jesus to be with you. And not just after we die, but now that your presence, you make your presence known on a daily basis to us, if only we would listen. God, I pray for my friends today that as they lean into what these scriptures say, they will be reminded of, of your great love for them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey friends, just a reminder of something that's available to you on the website. If you are going through this psalm study and you don't want to write in your Bible, I have special Bibles available for you at shehears.org in the resources section that are specifically for note-taking or journaling. So there's a couple different varieties to choose from, but I know for me, I didn't want to write in my actual study Bible. I wanted to have something specific when I was journaling that I felt okay about writing in. And so I have that available for you. I pray that that resource is a blessing to you. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call on your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His. This podcast is supported by Morgan Stanley. Old school wisdom with a passion for what's possible. That's what you get from the Morgan Stanley client experience. You get listening more than talking and a personalized plan built on insights and innovative technology. 
you get grit, vision, and the creativity to guide you through a changing world. Old School Grit, New World Ideas. Morgan Stanley. To learn more, visit morganstanley.com slash why us. Investing involves risk. Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, LLC.